Kelly Rooney looks pretty silly. And right here, Sutter, not the same offensive abilities of Lemieux, but boy, I'll tell you, that was taking it inside the post of Van Beesbrook with a quick glove. It wasn't quite as high as we were led to believe by the first look at it. You can see that Van Beesbrook catches it and then follows through all the way. The National Hockey League and was a premier goaltender. He won the Vezina Trophy with the New York Rangers and carried the Florida Panthers to their only appearance in the Stanley Cup Finals. And we want to thank him for being part of the program this morning. Welcome, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm on the clock now, so I've got to be quick. That's what they told me. I want to get up here, give your story, and get I going. I had this opportunity but to go to Sault Ste. Marie. I went there as a walk-on, and as an American going to a, you know, a Canadian junior hockey team at that time, it was uh, very odd. But I made the team and uh, was drafted thereafter by the New York Rangers and as an 18 year old I was able to play my first game in the National Hockey League. Uh, there were some injuries and um, I was very fortunate to uh, to get to uh, play under Herb Brooks at that time and, and Herb when I walked in the first day you know I was so nervous you know the miracle on ice had just happened this is 1981 and um, I walked into his office and he didn't shake my hand he, he poked me in the gut I was like, "What's what happened there?" He's just like, "That was a little unusual." I met a girl in Sault Ste. Marie. We've been married for 25 years. Um, yeah, you can clap for that. 25 years. Um, one stat on that is that in um, when I was playing in the alumni game at the Winter Classic this year, um, Matthew Schneider shared a, a real concerning comment with me because we were talking and catching up and, and Matthew's gone on to work for the NHLPA. He said, did you know that 75% of the NHL players uh, get divorced after their career's over? That's disturbing. So I thought to myself at that time, you know, family. We started a family. Um, we started our family in 1988. Uh, 1986, I won the Vesna Trophy. So what comes with that is some fame, some fortune, some money, not nearly with the, the money that's being made today. But you get shot right to the top. And I was, I was thinking that I was a pretty important person. And uh, we started a family, and it was all about me. It was my schedule. It was my performance. Everything was about me. And I thought to myself, well, you, I have everything, you know. You have uh, a great career. Uh, people are looking at you in a different way. You can go to a restaurant, get a prime seat, get a prime rib, prime everything. But at that time in my life, I was wondering what was missing. Um, I have wonderful wife, what more could you want? Um, great career, what more could you want? But I was empty. Uh, in 1990, he uh, fell into a state of depression. And, um, you know, I mean, today we look at depression um, and people still wonder what it is. Today we look at a story that was written in the New York Times trying to draw the correlation from fighting and hockey to concussion. When we know that's not the case, we know the case that's out there right now that people are getting checked harder, they're moving faster, there's no hooking and holding. Anybody who's a fan of the game can truly see that, but we want conclusions. That's what we want. We want to draw conclusions and see it the way we want to see it. So I called um, the doctor. My brother had checked himself into a hospital. I wanted to have an answer, a conclusion uh, to his story, an outcome. And when I called him, the doctor said, Frank, Frank, uh, Frank who? And as he paged through the roster, I could hear his, the pages flipping, and I, I, I thought to myself, is that what he had become? Is that his value of his life? Just another name on a page? 
It was quite concerning. He said, Frank, yeah, sorry, John, I can't help him. What do you mean you can't help him? My thoughts were, you're a doctor, you should be able to help him. Nope, can't help him. One reason. What's that? He doesn't want to help himself. At that point, it was like a light bulb and going off in my head. And then I got the call in late stages of 1992. Uh, my mom was crying on the other end that my brother had taken his own life. And at that time, I didn't cry. I didn't shed a tear. But I thought, is that what I, you know, have become? Where it's all about me? I think they call that vanity, but I'm not sure. That year also was very emotional because expansion was coming into the league. I was somewhere caught between Anaheim and Florida. I knew that I was going to go to this one great golf mecca after another. You know, it was, it was a great opportunity for me, and, uh, but it was emotional. So I was then traded to Vancouver for four days and then exposed in the 1993 expansion draft and picked first by Florida. And I thought to myself, we're going to sunshine, you know, playing golf and having a good time. Remember, it's all about me. And Roger um, started a chapel. It wasn't a mandatory chapel, it was voluntary, so I was the only guy that went. <laughs> so um, we started to just take the chapels and we made them into just breakfast times. And um, Steve would often ask me, hey, John, where's Jesus in your life? And I said, you know, I mean, I know who Jesus is. Um, I mean, I'm a C&E Christian. I go to church on Christmas and Easter, and, um, you know, I mean, but I know who he is. He'd say, okay, okay. At the same time, um, my wife started to change, and she um, started to watch hockey again. Um, I now know that she started to grow to resent me, and all my accolades, and she resented me because of my schedule and because it was all about me. But one day she came up to me and said, you know, I saw you play last night. We played in Boston. We had won. And um, she said, you played pretty good. Boy, that hit me right between the eyes. I'm a words of affirmation guy. I need to be told that I'm good. And uh, she started to glow again and to radiate. It brought me back to the time that we were, when we were dating, and I thought to myself, what's changing in her? What could she possibly like in me again? At the same time, Steve and I would gather together, and he'd ask me, where's Jesus in your life? And uh, we met at a very spiritual place called the IHOP. Uh, for you that don't know, it's the International House of Pancakes. I love breakfast. So Steve and I got together one morning uh, on an off day, and um, he asked me that question. I, now I got really mad, and I said this to him. Steve, you ask me this question every time. Where's Jesus in your life? Where's Jesus in your life? I don't see Jesus around here, do you? I can hug and hold my family and my wife, but I don't see Jesus. Well, Steve was very non-confrontational, but today, that day, he confronted me. And he said, John, uh, you don't understand. And I'm like, yeah, well, why don't you tell me? All nasty. He said, well, it's like this. You know, Jesus doesn't want to you know, be in this hierarchy in your family. He just wants to do one thing. He just wants to share. He wants to share your love. He wants to share your family's love. That's all he wants to do. There, I could feel something start to change in me. I could feel that emptiness, the same emptiness that, that Lori talked about. 
start to fill. And then he said this to me, if you really want to help yourself, that's what was said to my brother. He said, you just allow Jesus to come into your life and share your family's love. And at that moment, I thought to myself, I could do that. But what is, uh, what's the National Hockey League going to think? Am I going to be one of those guys? What about my contract? What about my family? What's my wife going to think? And on and on and on. So I sucked it up. Excuse me. And um, I looked across at him and he said, come on, let's just pray a prayer. So he reached out his hand and two, hand, two guys holding hands in an IHOP. Not a pretty, not a pretty thing. And uh, we prayed a prayer. And I looked up, and there was a waitress holding a, a jug of coffee. And she said, can I pray that prayer too? And I knew at that moment that this must be true. See, um, at that moment, I thought I, know all, I knew all the truths. Anything that I wanted to be true was true. So I left there, raced home, not knowing what to say to my wife. And I said to her, uh, I have something to tell you. She says, I have something to tell you too. So um, we put the kids to bed that night and sat on the side of the table, or the side of the bed. And uh, she said, go ahead. And I said, no, you, you go first. <laughs> so reluctantly, she... Um, she said, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior today. And then she kind of winced as if I was going to divorce her on the spot. And I said, that's amazing because I did the very same thing today. You know, we look at life in such a way that God doesn't interact when really he's interacting every day. Two people caught in what's called marriage, taking two separate routes, only to be brought back together again. I mean, whose love was that? I knew at that moment that I couldn't work this out. This was not of me. What was it about? Well, I knew at that moment that it was real love. It was the love of Christ. That the decision I made that day was a choice. The Bible says that He gives that choice freely. He gives it to all of us, equally. There is no partiality. There are no colors. There are no cultures. It's just a choice. I'd like to take a moment to read to you something that's so important. It's, it's called God's Word, if you'd allow me. And like I said, I came to tell you a story. One of the great things that we have are God's stories. More important than any of my words, or any of your words, are God's words. And I think it's very appropriate that one of the first stories that I learned from the Bible is a simple story. But I want, to, I want you to focus on who Jesus is speaking to and see if you can identify. It's called the parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. <clears throat> but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. 
Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not repent. Folks, you see, that day I was a lost sheep. Sheep are not very smart. I needed a shepherd to carry me on his shoulders. And if you haven't done and made that decision, you need the same shepherd. I came to tell a story, an important story, one that matters to uh, all generations, for all eternity, not to the end of the season, not to the end of the year, but one that we can proclaim for all eternity. The reason that the tax collectors and the sinners scoff and mock is because they didn't know him. I'm proud to say that I do. And I hope you do. Everyone needs compassion A love that's never been Let mercy